imagine a substance, a powder, that can be programmed to turn itself into a wide variety of molecules. It can turn itself into a diagnostic to pinpoint your illness, or it can be programmed to turn itself into an antibiotic to treat your infection, or maybe even a drug to treat cancer. Okay? This powder can be stored at room temperature easily, and whenever you want, it only requires a single step to make your desired molecules. All you have to do, and anybody can do this, is you just have to add water to it. That's it. What if making molecules for therapeutics and diagnostics was as easy as making instant coffee? I'm Peter Wynn, and I'm here today to share with you our ongoing efforts towards developing this technology at Harvard's Wies Institute and at MIT in the laboratory of Professor Jim Collins. This story has many facets. Um, this is a story about surprising biological activity that persists even after death. It's a story about discovering a pause button to preserve this activity so that you can use it in the future. And it's a story of the amazing capabilities and resilience of biological systems. So this powder sounds incredible, but how do you make it? How does it work? To answer that, our story has a start in the past, in 1907, Sweden, where Edward Buchner is being awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry um, for his work on yeast cells. So yeast cells are great to work with. You can grow them up in a flask or maybe a vat, and you can take these yeast cells and you can feed them sugars, right? Um, and they'll take these sugars and they'll happily gobble them up and they'll make for you alcohol and breathe off carbon dioxide, right? This is a process known as fermentation and it gives us our tasty beverages that we know as beer and wine. So what Buechner did was he collected these yeast cells, he put them into a mortar and pestle and he pulverized them, just crushed them. And from that, he collected the leftover fluid, which he called, yeah, he called it yeast juice. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're thinking, yeast juice. Yum, where can I get some, right? Um, so no, he didn't drink this juice, at least we don't think so. Uh, so this juice, it's not living, it's not alive. It can't replicate, right? It's just the leftover parts. It's the extracted innards of the cell. But surprisingly, this extract that's not alive could do things that a living yeast cell could do. You could give it sugars, and it will make for you alcohol, and it will emit carbon dioxide. In essence, this non-living extract was eating and breathing. And this breathing actually continued for days. It's been over a century since Buchner's discovery. And this finding has been replicated in many kinds of cells. You can take a bacterial cell, you can take a plant cell, you can take an insect cell, an animal cell, and yes, you can even take a human cell. And they've all been made into these active extracts. Also, in the past few decades, we have become exceedingly efficient at manipulating biology on the genetic level in all kinds of organisms. And we can apply those same strategies also to these extracts. I can take a bunch of extracts and I can actually feed programs into them. So these programs are information encoded into a piece of DNA or RNA. And the extract will read that program and it will start to stitch together the biomolecules that I want. All right. So this sounds very useful, which brings us to our next part, a little twist in the story. Now that you have this extract, how do you store it? Well, all biological things, all organic matter, will spoil if left, left out for long enough. Think a carton of milk or a hamburger, right? You can't eat a hamburger, put it on the counter, and then come back a week later to finish it off. At least I hope none of you do that. Of course not. It spoils, it rots. And in biology laboratories, you have a very similar situation. Bio labs are filled with freezers and refrigerators. Because when you're not using your cells, when you're not growing them, you have to freeze them or you have to put them in a refrigerator. And cell-free extracts, pretty much the same thing. They might not be alive, but it's still made of organic matter and it will still spoil. 
But in 2014, a colleague of mine, Keith Pardee, he found that you can actually freeze dry these extracts. In essence, you remove all the water so that now you get this fluffy white powder. And the powder can be stored at room temperature, no refrigeration needed. And you can sprinkle this with little DNA programs as well. In essence, what we have discovered is a very, very convenient pause button for biology. So now we have biology on pause, right? Next question is, well, if it's on pause, how do you activate it? How do you unpause this? The answer is actually quite simple. Whenever you want to, you can take this freeze-dried powder and you just add water, the elixir of life, and to re it reactivates the components of the powder. In essence, you have biomanufacturing capabilities at your fingertips, right? This is pretty much similar to a bag of ramen, yeah. right? Uh, think about that bag of ramen tucked away in the cupboard until that one night, maybe in a moment of desperation or pang of craving. You tear open that bag, you add water, wait a few minutes, and bam, instant ramen soup. In the same way, you can take our freeze-dried extract, sprinkled with a specific DNA program, and whenever you want, whenever you want, you just add water. And again, biomanufacturing capabilities at your fingertips. We've taken essentially uh, multi-million dollar factories that can produce biomolecules. We've taken that capability and we've shrunk it so that it fits down into the palm of your hand. No, you don't need fancy laboratory equipment. You don't need huge refrigeration infrastructure. You don't need specialized scientific training. To bake your molecules, all you need is to just add water. As a demonstration of the variety of molecules that you can produce, we published a study last year where we went after a number of molecules. We produced 10 different peptide antibiotics using this system that can be used to treat bacterial infections. We produced 15 different antibodies. These are molecules that can be used as diagnostics or therapeutics. We produced four different vaccines. And one of these was a diphtheria vaccine. We selected that, injected it into mice, and it worked. It Im immunized the mice. And we also produced five enzymes that work together to convert tryptophan, a very common and cheap amino acid, into an anti-malarial and anti-cancer compound. And all of this was just freeze-dried extract at room temperature, sprinkled DNA, and we just added water when we needed it. So this technology is only a few years old, but we can already see useful areas where it can be applied. The first area is on-demand therapeutics and diagnostics for field applications, such as disaster relief. Think of a, a city where the infrastructure is poor or has been destroyed, where the electricity and transportation chains have been compromised. And imagine in this setting being able to produce life-saving insulin right when and where you need it, insulin that would have otherwise spoiled because you have no electricity to power refrigeration. Or consider on-demand and on-site vaccine production to combat an outbreak in a remote region. With this technology, you can shrink an entire pharmacy, potentially, into a small portable box. Just find a source of clean water, and you're ready to go. The second area that we see an impact is in the democratization of science. So before, to experiment with biology, you needed pretty specialized and expensive equipment. This technology does away with that. Now anyone can affordably begin to explore and experiment with biotechnology and bioengineering. We think this will be especially transformative in science education. Now this allows a whole slew of biology experiments to be implemented in the classroom at a very low cost and with no specialized equipment. Think of it as a synthetic biology version of the chemistry kit, but for the 21st century. And the third area that we see an impact is a bit further off in the future, and it's about how we can apply this on-demand technology with how we currently make our therapeutics. Uh, what if you didn't have to go to the pharmacy to pick up your medication, your, your 
insulin or your arthritis medication? What if instead you just downloaded the information to make that drug and it's made on demand right for you when and where you need it? Kind of like playing an MP3 or downloading an MP3. The benefits of this would actually be enormous because all drugs once made have an expiration date, right? And once the drugs hit their expiration dates, they're all thrown away, even if they're unused. So there's a massive amount of waste in the drug industry that contributes to our high healthcare costs. What if you only made the therapeutics you need right when and where you needed it? And with that, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is that you don't need a living cell to do biology. It's kind of surprising, but it's true. The second thought is that just by controlling the presence or the absence of water, you can put biology on pause for years, maybe decades. And the third thought is something for you to consider. So biology is capable of fabricating things of incredible complexity. Just take a look in the mirror. We are the product of natural biomanufacturing. And now we've harnessed that power we've distilled that power into an incredibly practical format. How will that change the way we make things? I'm excited to see, so stay tuned. And with that, I think I will hit the pause button for now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>